there's this sort of standard version of history that we all get uh, that tells a story whereby progress and light has come about uh, when more power has been transferred to the federal government and the results have all been wonderful and the only people who could oppose this are obviously deranged lunatics and, mm-hmm. and this is this this is the implicit narrative in almost every american history textbook on the market today and i have more or less spent my time uh, debunking this and i've been able to get uh, some traction with it partly because I have some of the establishment credentials that normally these people would flash in my face and say, how dare you question me? I have a <laughs> Ph.D. from so-and-so. Well, right, so do right. I. Yeah, yes. so, so now that we've gotten that nonsense out of the way, now can we actually get to the issues? I love it. Well, there, there's, uh, it's a target-rich environment as far as things to discuss. I, uh, Tom, I, I'd really love to get your, your take on, on the... If you could narrow it down to to one, one of the most major misunderstandings that most Americans carry around with them what would you wish more Americans could grasp and i don't oh, mean what, what, what was taught to them in school but what what would you want them to know oh you're absolutely killing me because it's, it's a tie what is it like a 58 way tie <laughs> <laughs> in 1 minute or less tom <laughs> all right look i mean I, i'm going to draw one at random okay, okay. i'll just draw I'm almost at random, right. just because I'm, I'm interested in it uh, these days, and I know that there's been some interest in it in Utah also, mm-hmm. uh, and that is that uh, the subject of, of so-called states' rights has been so toxified in people's minds that I would say the average American thinks that when you talk about the states, you're probably operating on the basis of some kind of sinister agenda. You probably want to restore segregation or maybe even slavery. I mean, like, this mm-hmm. is the sure. level of discourse that we've been reduced to in this free country of ours, that you actually have to say as a preface, well, look, well, look hey, everybody, I'm against slavery. I mean, in the year 2012, you actually have to say, I'm ag- well, <laughs> duh, you should be, it should be a courtesy that people would assume you're... So one of the things that I've done in, uh, well, I don't know, some in my book Nullification or um, my biggest selling book was The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, was to show that to the contrary... If you look through all of U.S. history, what you find is that the idea of states' rights developed uh, not out of uh, a concern of, to defend slavery. To the contrary, uh, states' rights were used, and nullification of, of uh, unconstitutional laws was used to fight against slavery. It was used to fight against the fugitive slave laws. It was used to um, fight against unconstitutional searches and seizures in New England. It was used to fight on behalf of free speech in Virginia and Kentucky. But you don't get this story at all because, again, what the schools want to teach you is this comic book version of history uh, in which the, the states are the great repositories of wickedness and the federal government is the source of progress. So anybody who wants to oppose the federal government, by definition, is an ogre and wicked and evil. This story has as it's so reversed uh, that you, one hardly knows where to start. But now I'm going to cheat and say that the other one, the other thing that's tied with this would be that people think that the reason we have the standard of living we have is because the federal government imposed a lot of regulations and, and minimum wage laws and all that. And without that, well, good heavens, we'd all be crawling around in the dirt. We'd be earning three cents an hour, and our kids would be getting their limbs blown off. And I, I mean, I, when I was in the seventh grade, that's what I was taught. Right. Uh, but I, again, I, what I'm trying to show in my work is that to the country, what the, the only thing that the federal government has accomplished with regard to econ- the economy is to retard it, and our standard of living is to retard it. That is the only thing it has accomplished. Right. And that the advances we've seen have all been because of the market, all been because businesses are able to invest in equipment that makes you more productive, which means they can afford to pay you more. If you're only able to produce three dollars worth of stuff for them, there ain't no way they're going to pay you twenty bucks an hour. Right. The and only way you're going to be able to get twenty bucks an hour is if you can produce that much stuff. And how can you do that if you don't have a forklift or equipment that you need? And that comes from investment, which comes from a free economy. It does not come from government. Right. In your in your first chapter, you finish that by describing the crisis. Um, the crisis being the the now sixteen trillion dollar federal debt. And you say, don't worry, the Republican Party wants to cut the bloated federal budget by one hundred billion. But you say that's like taking three dollars off a trip to the moon. What do you mean? Right. Well, first of all, the book we're talking about here is my most recent one. It's called Rollback. Roll mm-hmm. And of course, in this, we remember Rollback as you know, roll back the commies from you know, like the nineteen sixties <laughs> right. and seven. You know, whereas people see Rollback now and they think, what are you talking about, Walmart? Like, Come on, now, people, <laughs> think historically here. So, to, yeah, Rollback. The right. point of it is that, as you say, we are in this uh, this you know budgetary mess. Mm-hmm. 
But it's the, the book is not about the budget per, per se. It starts off talking about that, and, mm-hmm. I, and I want to address that. But the idea of it is that given that we're in this crunch anyway, let's go back and revisit all these things we were sold that we supposedly can't live without, that right. the government does, and see if we actually could live without them. But the, uh, but the gist of it uh, that I'm talking about is that we've got this debt, that's true, on the books. But what we also have is the, the are these what we've heard about a lot these days the unfunded liabilities which is these are this is the amount that is due to that will be coming due over the next uh, decades to people who are expecting to receive medicare and social security there's an amount that is not yet paid for like you know you people right. put their money into it and the government just blew it on other stuff so the um, and, and the, now the government collects some taxes payroll taxes to fund these programs but that's not enough to fund them. So the amount that they're short is the unfunded liability. And the problem is that there's a professor at uh, Boston University. He's a Democrat, so you can't accuse him of being some fiscal hawk, <laughs> Lawrence Kotlikoff. And he's come out and said every year, he comes out and gives his estimate, here's what the present value of the unfunded liabilities is. And this year he said it's in excess of, you're not going to believe this, in excess of $220 trillion dollars. Wow. Now, that's a lot of money, but actually it's even worse than it sounds, because he's not saying this is the amount of money we're going to owe in the coming years. What he's saying is, in order to make good on all the promises the federal government has made, this is the amount of money we would need to invest today and begin getting a, a good return on it over the next 75 years, and then we'll be able to make these payments. Now, the U.S. government does not have a spare $220 trillion to invest. So mathematically, you can see this. This no way this can be done. Like eventually, promises are not going to be kept. Uh, they're going to renege on the promises. Somebody's going to be left holding the bag, and so we've got to prepare ourselves for this. And and it's not it's not uh, fear mongering. It's not uh, be, I mean, to the contrary. If you know that like if if we knew there was a comet that was going to come hit us, you know we would want to prepare ourselves. That that's all. You know it's coming. Right. You've got to prepare yourself. And, and, and again, one way you prepare yourself is to, again, divorce yourself from the propaganda that tells you, well, without the government, you can't survive, man. <laughs> All the good things of civilization have come from the government, and your standard of living comes from the government. We've got to get away from that, yeah. because that, you know, those days are over. Like, we can't even afford to believe those fantasies, even if they were true. For, for those just joining us, we're talking with Tom Woods. He's an economist. He's an, an historian and, and a Many fountain, mm-hmm. fountain of information. Um, Tom, one of the things that, that I really, I have difficulty trying to describe this to people, there are two competing schools of thought, actually there's more than two, but two primary competing schools of thought in economics, the Austrian school, the Keynesian school. Um, is, there, is there a way to, to uh, put that in a thumbnail sketch? How do you, how do you differentiate between those two schools? Well, uh, it, it, just in case your listeners are thinking, oh, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, I've got to change the station now. This is too complicated. No, 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 no. <laughs> Every voter has got to know this stuff because basically you guys are, and, and when I say you guys, I mean all of us, all of sure. us in this country have been screwed by the same economic philosophy. It's the same, it doesn't matter whether it's Democrats or Republicans. By and large, they all swear fealty to John Maynard Keynes and his system of economics that he cooked up in 1936. Now, you may say, how can this be so important? I never heard of this Keynes guy. Well, that's kind of the way they like it. Because the, the more you look into this guy, the more you say, this guy's a crackpot. I can't believe this is where people are getting their inspiration. But to make a long story very short, when you hear things like, we need stimulus to get the economy going again, or we need to push interest rates lower to get people lending and borrowing, and we, we've got to stimulate and this and that and this and that, that's coming from a Keynesian mentality. The Keynesian view is that the market economy is just not stable. You cannot trust it to correct itself or to operate smoothly. You need some kind of a helmsman uh, and, and driving the economy and pushing it in this direction or that, pumping in spending when necessary, whatever. And I'd take a wild guess as to who that helmsman is. You'll never guess. It's the government. <laughs> so you know, now you understand why the government likes this philosophy. Because, hey, miracle of miracles, it calls upon the government to do what it wants to do anyway. So naturally, they, none of these politics. You think Barney Frank has sat down and said, I'm going to read Keynes's book from 1930. Of course not. Mm-hmm. All he cares about is this guy's telling me that the best thing the government can do when there's a downturn, is to blow a lot of cash and spend it on my constituents, then darn it, that's what I'm going to do. He doesn't care what the rationale is. <laughs> are, are, now, the Austrians, yeah. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. 
Okay, so the Austrian school has nothing to do with the country of Austria. The Austrian school is just another competing way of looking at the economy. And the, re- and the Austrians now, the Austrians are the oldest school of thought that still exists in the world. And the Austrians are enjoying a huge comeback because it was the Austrians overwhelmingly. Again, they're not from Austria. The original thinkers are from Austria. But the point is that these are economists who, in let's say 2003, 2004, were saying there's something wrong with the housing market here. This is not normal. It's not normal that people think, yeah, you know, I have no job, so let me go out and get five investment properties that I'll just pay the interest on, Mm -hmm. and I will automatically become rich. Just by sitting in my house... I'm going to become rich. The authors are the ones saying, you know, there's something wrong with that. Like, that's not normal. And they were the ones saying, and we know why there's something wrong with it, because the Federal Reserve keeps pumping all this money in. It keeps going into the mortgage market. It's pushing interest rates down. It's making people think real estate is a better investment than it's going to turn out to be. And this is going to lead to a big crash down the road. People were laughing at the Austrians. <laughs> what are you talking about? All the experts, the Federal Reserve economists, they're all saying, what? No, the, the housing market is super. There's nothing wrong with it, you crackpots. And then 2007, 2008 came along, and suddenly, suddenly these same people who couldn't see a thing wrong, they're now saying two things. One, well, we know exactly what went wrong, and we're going to go fix it with more regulation. Now, wait a minute. These are the people who thought there was nothing wrong. Why would we listen to them now in telling us what to do about it? They didn't even see there was a problem. But secondly, these are people who are now saying, no one could have seen this coming. No one could have seen this coming. Now, meanwhile, the whole Austrian school of economics, the school of thought that spans the globe, has for years been warning that this is going to happen. They have been basically defined out of existence. Well, no one could have seen this coming. Oh, yeah, no one? Yeah, look at those kids at the back of the classroom raising their hands, putting their hands way up in the air. These are the ones who were predicting it, who were saying. So now suddenly people are wondering, well, how did they figure it out? But the Internet now makes it possible for people like the Austrians to make their case to the public. The New York Times doesn't want you to think there is an Austrian school. It's just the Keynesians, and you're stuck with us, and that's all you've got. But thanks to the Internet, people are figuring out, gosh, there were people who had a clue. Hmm. How did they figure it out? Was it tea leaves? Was it uh, a tarot <laughs> card deck? How did they figure it out? And right. basically, the Austrians are saying that the very sorts of things the Keynesians are proposing as the solution are the problem. The stimulus is the problem. It was stimulus in 2001 that gave us the problem. When Alan Greenspan thought, well, you know what, let's stimulate housing by dropping interest rates super low. That was the problem. You, you know, yeah. if, if people want to buy houses, let them buy houses. But don't don't skew their decision making by mm-hmm. falsifying interest rates and making people make investments they wouldn't otherwise have made they're they're basically encouraging people to make investments that the economy was trying to say don't do this right. we're trying to give red lights but every light was turned green by the government and the federal reserve that's what the austrians are saying and that's why they're enjoying this great uh, rebirth of interest that's a great point now we have two presidential candidates and this is for our audience this was a question from our audience we have two presidential candidates what school of thought do they both have? What's your well, assessment? Um, Obama is basically a center-left Keynesian, and uh, Romney is a right-wing Keynesian. So that's your big choice. They're basically, I mean, for example, Romney was asked, uh, look, we have this major, major budget problem. We've got trillion-plus dollar deficits. Uh, this is going to really, really hurt us in the very near future. Uh, maybe we need the kind of budget that uh, Ron Paul proposed, where you cut a trillion dollars right away. Just get that money right. back into the hands of the private sector. And his response was, no, 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 that would cause a depression. Well, mm-hmm. that is the Keynesian view, that, that major budget cuts cause depressions. Now, that is not, that's not had, has been historically the case after World War II. We had the biggest budget cut in the history of the country. And you know what we also got? the single most prosperous year in the history of the private economy in the U.S., 1946, the most robust growth ever, and that was on the heels of the most severe budget cuts ever. But basically, uh, Romney holds to this view that, we, that government spending cures recessions. Well, uh, you know, I'm sorry, that's not really much of a choice as far as I'm concerned. Right, right. And it, it's a little depressing, isn't it? I mean, if they're both in the same school of thought, I mean, do you see much difference in either one, or do you do you see any any clear cut difference between the two? Well, I mean, they're both going to give lip service to cu- cutting the budget eventually, mm-hmm. but we all know what eventually means. Eventually, right. in political speak, means never. It always means never. Or I've got a twenty five year plan to balance the budget, which is basically the the uh, the Ryan budget. 
It's it's basically or what, what is it? No, it's a twenty eight year plan <laughs> uh, because he's going to budget balance the budget in in the year two thousand forty. I mean, you know, I happen to think the problem is a teensy-weensy bit more urgent than that. So it is very demoralizing. I mean, of course, there will be some differences in terms of what are their priorities and where do they want the money spent. But the money will be spent, uh, regardless of which one gets in. I mean, there will be very marginal changes. That's the way our system works, that they, they try to portray themselves as being poles apart. But no matter which one you elect... You get the same bailouts. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you get this more or less the same foreign policy. I mean, it's it, you get very marginal tinkering around the edges. It basically boils down to who gets the cushy jobs, your supporters or my supporters. That's the major mm-hmm. difference. Wait, and, and you talk about debt repudiation. What do you mean by that? Because that was one of the solutions um, at the end of the book rollback um, that maybe we we take the debt and what do what with it. Well, all right. Now, look, I'm not in politics, so I can just come right out and say whatever I darn well can. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and I, well, I, I take my inspiration from uh, one of the great 20th century economists, Murray Rothbard, who, who said this. He said, think of all the debts that were racked up by the communist governments of Eastern Europe. Mm-hmm. I mean, should those suffering people who lived under those regimes, should they be on the hook for these debts, or should they not just turn around and say, look, that's your own stinking fault for lending to a communist government in the first place, you know? So you, you right. got what you deserved. You're not getting paid. Uh, and that seems like the just solution. Well, here, basically, what we could do, it's a, just, it's a difference between ripping a Band-Aid off quickly, and it's painful, but it's quick, and it's over. Or you pick at it for 20 years or 40 years when we all know uh, they can't do it. Like, there's no way they can pay off what to do. That is impossible. There is no way it can be done. They're not even trying. And as I say, when they even try to cut $100 billion out of a, what, you know, all, mm-hmm. approaching $3 trillion budget, this is a, this is, even this is, is described as austerity and what right. right-wing extremists these are, then obviously it's not going to happen. So, I mean, instead of just little by little repudiating it, which is what they're going to try to do mm-hmm. by inflating the value of it away, they might as well just be honest, clear this away so that we can... Because fu- otherwise, this is an albatross around our neck that's just going to last for 50 years. Why don't we just start fresh, admit we have a problem, mm-hmm. you know, and it's the first step, and then you can start from a sound foundation again. But just pretending that this is some real obligation that's going to be met someday... Mm-hmm. Uh, and then just using inflation, which screws up the economy, and doing that every single year is uh, is much worse, much, much worse. Right. I have actually have a question for you on this. I thought of, I was thinking about yesterday. What would happen to our lands if we were to do that? We owe all of this money. We pretty much bankrupt out as a nation and say, you know, dead over. But do we have to pay that in lands? What What would be the, the what would happen? Well, I mean, there are different people who hold the U.S. government debt, right? There are Americans mm-hmm. who hold it, mm-hmm. and there are foreigners who hold it. And I think it would be difficult to say to the Chinese, look, we're just not paying. Right. But in one way or another, they probably realize we aren't going to pay, or, or we're going to pay in depreciated dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but, what, but what would this mean? Well, okay, it, what it would mean is that interest rates would shoot up in terms of uh, if the U.S. government ever wants to borrow again, mm-hmm. who would ever lend to the U.S. government at this point? Because they know that you're going to get you're going to get the shaft. Right. And so if, if the U.S. government wants to borrow, it's going to have to borrow at very high interest rates to compensate lenders for the risk. And to me, I say, hooray. <laughs> I say these lenders have been the greatest enablers right. of People and I don't view the people in the U.S. government as wonderful, selfless public servants. I think basically these are sociopaths who thrive on power and influence, who do not care about the public welfare. And the people lending to us have been enabling these people. They've been enabling the people who have oppressed us, looted us, ripped us off. And so I, I have no sympathy for people who have lent to the U.S. government. It's your own stupid fault. It was mm-hmm. evil of you to have done it and stop doing it. I, I think you, you're saying what most people are thinking right now. By the way, if, if you're just joining us, Tom Woods is, yeah. is our guest. And if, if you've ever wondered, could subjects like history and economics be interesting and fun? Well, if you've been listening to Tom Woods, you'll know, he, yes, he in fact, they fun. can. Yeah. Now, um, Tom, the, w- when you talk about the enablers, I think about uh, the central banking system, particularly the Federal Reserve. If there were a repudiation of that national debt, would that uh, spell doom for the Federal Reserve system? Uh, well, let's see. I mean, the, the the Fed is holding a whole lot of of, uh, of government debt, but the whole but the whole relationship between the Fed and the federal government is a is a really bizarre one. 
Uh, because in the old days, the way a, a king would inflate the money supply is he would call in all the coins, and then he would clip some of the metal and keep it. And then he would melt the coins back down so that you wouldn't notice that it had been clipped, and then give them back to the people at the same value. But meanwhile, he's stolen from them. He stole some of that metal. Well, today they can't do it quite so obviously. But basically it's the same darn thing, because the U.S. government needs to borrow money. And so what does it do? It issues a, a bond, and eventually the Federal, Federal Reserve buys it. Now, okay, the U.S. government has to pay interest on that bond, but at the end of the year, the Fed is required to return the interest. So, okay, so the, the federal government doesn't really have to pay interest on them because the Fed returns the interest. But, okay, well, eventually the federal government will have to pay the principal on that bond, right? Eventually it has to pay it off. But, no, the, the, the system is that as soon as that bond comes due, the federal government rolls it over by issuing a, a new bond to pay off the old bond. The Fed acquires that one, and it never gets paid. Right. It's it never gets paid off. So the Fed has all these things on its on its balance sheet, but they never get paid off. They ultimately get rolled over. They get new ones over time. But, I mean, my view is that what we ought to just do, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve is this sort of topic that most people don't know anything about and their eyes glaze over. And I realize, are we, are we coming up on a bottom of the hour break? We are. Yeah. Okay, so I won't go into this in any depth, but I'll just say that the Fed is the institution that creates that has the power, monopoly power, to create legal tender money. And it has abused this power to the point where if you looked at the U.S. dollar from 1800 to 1900, it actually got more valuable. If you just sat on it, it got more valuable. But from 1900 to 2000, it lost 96% of its value. And we are told, where would we be? We'd be adrift without these people. You know what? Somehow I think we'd scrape by. (laughs) <laughs> Good point. Uh, Tom, are you okay to hang with us past the, the bottom of the hour break? Sure. Okay. okay. I, I have some questions for you, the other side of our commercials, uh, about Liberty Classroom and, and how people okay. can, can get their minds around the issues and, and go forth uh, well-armed in terms of uh, intellectual ammunition. Thomas Woods is our guest. We'll be back right after this. This is your Glenn Beck, Glenn Beck Station. Station. Fox News Radio, 93.1 FM and 1450 AM, KZNU. Good morning. It's 835. Welcome to the Perspectives Morning Show with Brian and Kate. Hi, Brian. Hello, Kate. And hi to Tom Woods. Tom Woods on the telephone with us. Tom, thanks for hanging with us this morning. Glad to be here. Yep. Now, um, for those who don't know, you have an information-packed website, and and we want to give people a chance to visit that. I think Kate has thrown a link up on Mm -hmm. our Facebook page. Um, What is the website where people can find you? TomWoods.com, and basically I, I blog there, although this week I am going on, my policies, I go on one field trip with each of my children per term, mm-hmm. and they're all in one week, so the blogging's been a little light this week, <laughs> I don't want you to make any judgments, but at TomWoods.com I do blog, but I also have a lot of my articles and videos and audio, and just, I mean, it's all free stuff. Right. Now, now, I'm curious, when you go on field trips, what, what would be a suitable field trip for you and for the Woods children? Uh, well, well, they they go to a, a a very good like non-propaganda private school. Like I don't feel like I have to deprogram them at the end of the day. It's a very <laughs> right. miracle. Right. But uh, like the other day, we went to the apple orchard and uh, they they picked apples and then made applesauce out of it. That sort of thing. Um, so you know we do you know cutesy little things like that. Or the Kansas History Museum. They went there and they went to a a, a buffalo farm and so you know it's a cute little trip. Yeah, yeah, I love okay. it. Okay. Now, you also make a lot of great information available to people through Liberty Classroom. Tell us a little bit about your Liberty Classroom. All right, so here's the thing. So I, I came to the conclusion that I am spending too much time griping. You know, griping about the fact that kids are learning propaganda in their college classroom or in their high school classroom, and there's nothing I can do about this, and it frustrates me. So I finally thought, wait a minute, there is something I can do. And it's not just write books, although I've enjoyed doing that, but... The Internet makes possible, I mean, miracles that none of us could have imagined uh, 10 or 15 years ago even, uh, what, what really the real possibilities of it are. So I finally decided I can't replace the faculty of Yale University. There's nothing I can do about that. But I can go over their heads. I can create my own site where I just teach U.S. history. Now, I'm not one of these people who, who thinks that if you have credentials, that automatically means people have to bow down before you. But the fact is, the establishment would want to come after me for this. So I, it's good that I have the credentials. I have an undergrad degree from Harvard and my Ph.D. from Columbia. So I have got the establishment credentials, but I always thought that when I got into those universities, I want those places to 
uh, regret the day that they ever admitted me, basically. <laughs> so anyway, so I, what I finally decided to do is I'm just going to have my own website where I teach U.S. history, and I teach it so that you can listen in your car, or if you want, if you like to watch me talking, you can see it in video. And then for each topic that I cover, I give you readings. Like, I've read all this stuff, and I kind of know what's not worth your time and what is, so I, I, I link to recommended readings. The idea of it is to inoculate people against propaganda that's current in our society and also to help the students in your family to get to navigate through some of this stuff they're probably going to be hearing in their classes. So it's U.S. history from beginning to the present. It's Western civilization from the beginning to the present. It's sound economics in the Austrian tradition that I mentioned, uh, all of that. Um, and I'm going to say I have not revealed this to anybody, so your program is the first one. On Monday, we're, we're launching our, our own. For some reason, people, I ask them, what course do you want to see us add? Mm -hmm. And people are saying, we want a course on logic, like how to spot nice. bad arguments. Monday, we are launching our course on logic. And the idea is that you don't have to sit, you can just download and listen in your car. You don't have to tune in at 5 p.m. And then uh -huh. listen to, And then if you don't understand something, we're there to answer your question. So it's, it's, it makes me feel like I'm making a contribution. Well, I, I would, I wholeheartedly agree that you've made huge contributions. You've contributed greatly to my own development as what I consider a freedom crusader. Uh, but I want to ask you, where, is, where does the disconnect kick in? Why is it that there are so few Americans today who, who will actively pursue topics or will think through these topics, but instead believe that only experts can tell us what it all means? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, in part, I think people have been intimidated into thinking this about the experts. Uh, like, for example, a topic like we discussed earlier, the Federal Reserve, I mean, you are ridiculed if you even think you're entitled to an opinion on the Federal Reserve. Why, why the experts have already told you that we need the Federal Reserve. And the experts have, you know, it's, it is, I think it's also something that is drilled into people's heads a lot of times in the course of their formal education. That, uh, look, this is the book. It's written by the expert. You memorize it and reproduce it on the test. It's that kind of mentality. And a lot of times, I used to be a uh, college professor, and I found that um, I did have occasionally the, a, a really bright student. But most of my sort of smart students were really just good tape recorders. They could reproduce what I had said. They could reproduce what was in the book. But the idea that they would critically assess it was just like utterly beyond them. Like they, they were not interested in doing it, and they weren't sure they could do it. That's not what I, and I did my best to convey, but this was after 12 years of being sort of taught that the answers are in the book. Right, right. Did you grow up in the public education um, system? I mean, when did this yes, light I kick did. on for you? Yes, I did. Well, you know, it's funny. When I come across kids who are, let's say, like I get emails from 15-year-olds who say, mm -hmm. I've watched the videos on your YouTube channel. I mean, I'm thrilled. I've got like 1.3 million views on my view YouTube I channel. And, and most of my videos aren't even on my channel. They're on other people's channels. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I'm, the Internet makes right. it possible for me to reach this huge audience. And they'll write to me and say, I've been watching your videos, and it really, I've read the books you've recommended. It has changed my life. And I think to myself, gosh, if only my head were screwed on so tight when I had been 15 years old. <laughs> right. But basically, it was... You know, today, if people want to break free of this, they have the whole Internet. They do one Google search, and they're off to the race, and they find there are different ways of understanding certain events or the economy or whatever. Whereas with me, I saw an ad in a magazine that said, hey, we're having a week-long seminar on free market economics at the Ludwig von Mises Institute. Why don't you come to it? So I... I sent away for their brochure, mm -hmm. like we used to do before the Internet, you know, set my <laughs> right, envelope right. with a self Snail mail. Envelope. Yeah, and, and I went to that thing for a week, and I was immersed in it, and I basically left saying, all right, this is true. Like, th this, I am completely convinced, it, is, it practically compels my ascent. And from that moment on, I just thought, well, this is, this is the tradition of thought I want to study in, the sort of um, Austrian school, free market, uh, freedom-oriented way of looking at the world. And I became increasingly convinced this is correct. And I started making my own contributions to it with, uh, with the books that I've done. Right. You talk about agorism uh, and, and the fact that it rejects political activity. Tell us about agorism and, where, and how can we do that? It says that you know, individuals have the right to interact peacefully without the intervention of the state. Mm, okay. Now, this is probably the, one of the first major radio stations that has ever discussed agorism. Ever. Really? So this is like we are we are breaking through <laughs> barriers here today. <laughs> uh, now I, I will I will preface this by saying not everyone is ready to hear this message, right? Okay. I mean, you have to prepare the ground. Right. But I will say that there is a subset of people who are sort of broadly considered libertarians who would say that look the political system is so obviously corrupt 
and it is it's just filled with basically the scum of the earth mm-hmm. and when and when they're losing they just change the rules and it's just impossible for you ever to win like the the old boy network will always win out in politics but they would, but more than that they would say what is politics after all it's the arena in which people are jockeying to get control of other people's property it's always what it right. boils down to as as h l Mencken said every election is always an advance auction on stolen goods that's basically <laughs> what it is i'll like steal that. your neighbor's stuff to give you this right, right. that guy is only going to steal that neighbor's stuff to give you that that's what it, and they're basically saying the agorists are people who say this is immoral i don't want to take part in this mm-hmm. i don't want to be part of some indirect looting of my neighbor i believe in peacefully interacting with my my neighbor, not voting for some guy who's going to expropriate him. And so agorism is basically saying the state is, is, uh, is basically, uh, it encourages this. It's, it's founded in theft and mutual plunder, and I don't want to be part of that system. And so instead of trying to get elected to its various offices uh, and try and reform it from within, I'm going to see what I can do to undermine it from without. I'm going to try to, to fight against it by inflicting a million little cuts on it by just refusing to consent to it uh, intellectually and also by just finding ways in my community that I can live without it. So there are places, particularly in New Hampshire, there are people who believe in agorism who don't want to use even the government's courts. They say, we agorists, we will have our own dispute resolution services and we will abide by them just to show, to give the moral example to the world that we don't need these monopolistic services that are funded in this immoral way. And so basically what they're saying is if you can find some way to uh, get out from under the, mm-hmm. the state, then go ahead and do it. Right, And, like, and that's, that, that's, that's what you ought to do. The phrase I've heard associated with agorism is reducing your governmental footprint. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that is, that's basically right. And just try to live free the best you can. I mean, you can't, you individually may not change the whole world, but you, through your individual example, your moral example, the idea is that you're building up parallel institutions mm-hmm. where people can interact voluntarily outside of what is perceived to be an immoral system. Uh, now, this, is, this goes way beyond what you would normally hear from a free market economist who will come on and tell you that price controls lead right. to shortages and, you know, free trade is good. This is way beyond that. Well, I mean, we don't want to deal in that, that piddly little stuff, Tom. <laughs> we exactly. want to get to the heart. <laughs> the marketplace is the, is the arena. Where, I mean, that's where agorism comes from, from right. agora, the, right. you know, the Greek marketplace, open marketplace. Is that That's where moral interaction occurs. That's where I don't just come and bop you over the head and take your stuff. This is where we're going to have an exchange only if you want the exchange and I want the exchange, and we both feel like we benefit. The state is just the opposite. This exchange is going to happen and because I've got a gun in your ribs, and right. whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. And it's not even an exchange. The, the, the exchange that the government has is we're coming to take your stuff, and that's it. Right. You know, like that's right. the exchange. Exactly. Because I think agorism for us, the reason I wanted to bring it up is because people say, well, what can we do? I mean, this is, what can I do just as me, as a person? And, and what you're saying is, is that we are already, most of us already have had a form of agorism. We've either driven with a radar detector, we've sped when the cop isn't around, we've had a yard sale right. without a permit. I mean, we're already doing <laughs> it or, or being paid in cash, you know, yeah. and uh, most of us have done yeah, that. Exactly. Right? right. Yeah. I mean, are you, are you reporting all the income from your garage sale? Heavens you know? no. I mean, really. Yeah. And, and um, now, by the way, because I take a position like this, I'm very scrupulous about those things because I mm-hmm. know that you know they'd be inclined to come after me. But but right. the point is that everybody, <laughs> in one way or another, knows that there's at least something going on mm-hmm. that's unjust. That one way or another, that they they fight against. Well, they're saying, well, we're just doing what you do, but we're giving it a philosophical rationale. Right. Right. Hey, again, if you're just joining us, Tom Woods is our guest. We are so fortunate to, to have some of his busy schedule today Absolutely. coinciding with our broadcast. Now, Tom, you have a number of excellent books, um, Rollback, Nullification, and I've only scratched the surface. Meltdown. What, what, meltdown. What are some of the other ones? Well, the, the, the one that is sort of the entry point, I think, for a lot of people, uh, and I wish I could take credit for how clever the title is, but the publisher thought of the title, is called The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History. <laughs> and it's just sort of a one quick... It. It, the idea is it's supposed to be fun and easy to read and breezy, but if you want to read further, I recommend... Here, here are books that I think are reliable. But when we did The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, that was such a success, I'm happy to report, that the publisher decided they're going to do a whole series of books, which they have since done, The Politically Incorrect Guide to X. So they've done The Politically Incorrect Guide to Global Warming or or uh, to the, the Bible and all diff- other different things where they take kind of a conservative, libertarian stance 
and go through and just give it, it's sort of for, for people who say I wish I knew more about X but I just don't have time to sift through 50 books well this is like one book that gives you a fun cutting through the propaganda introduction so that one I'm particularly pleased with but all, all the different books that I have are at uh, TomWoods.com let me point out just because I forgot it when we were talking about agorism the great example of it I think mm-hmm. is homeschooling because when people yes. started off doing that they were outlaws. Like, you're not allowed to do this. Right. In fact, in Europe, I mean, Europeans look at us like we're insane if we allow homeschooling here. They really right. think it's typical, stupid uh, you know, Americans. Mm-hmm. But that was di- directly defying the state. And then it became so big that the state really couldn't stop it after a while. And that became a real advance for the free part of society against the power part of society, it, that homeschooling succeeded. That is a, that is a great example of how these folks are imagining agorism would work. It becomes a mass movement that's so big that it would be, I mean, obviously they could always roll in the tanks, but right. I, I don't think people would sit by and let that happen. The point is that they would not be able to stop it, ultimately. And, Tom, you, you mentioned that the Internet and the, the flow of information online has also opened doors that previously were not open. I'm just curious, you know, you have your Liberty Classroom. I see online education growing by leaps and bounds. Is this another place where agorism is going to uh, outpace the ability of the state to contain it? I think so, because now it means that the gatekeepers of opinion... Uh, you know, now, the, as one of my friends puts it, the gates are still up. We still have a New York Times and a Newsweek and whatever, but the walls have fallen down. Because now people can just go right around these things and find alternative, more reliable sources online. Sometimes those reliable sources, by the way, can be traditional newspapers, but published in other countries. Like half the time, you have to get the, the truth from a British paper. Uh, but also there are a lot of independent journalists out there. There's so many sources now that people can go to. Uh, and then in terms of education... As you mentioned, my site, libertyclassroom.com, is my own personal way, and I have a few other faculty people that I trust helping me with it, uh, to, to say that there, this is a non-state alternative. Now, it's for personal enrichment. It's not accredited at this time, but a lot of people want personal enrichment. They just want to know the truth, and you are increasingly going to see challenges to this system that is totally unaffordable for people. And it, 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 when you look at the half of the professors who are involved in it, they're, they're lazy bums with tenure who just sit and blog on their website all day. You think of the old-time medieval universities. These professors were required to debate openly on a regular basis. I mean, these, these professors today, they would die a thousand deaths before debating a topic before the general public. And so uh, it, now that the Internet makes it so cheap to educate mm-hmm. people, how are they going to continue a business model where people have got to pay 160 grand? for an education. I don't right. see how it continues. Well, you have a class for, for kids um, that, that you're able to do online, and also is the Politically Incorrect Guide to American History. Would that be a good place to start with our kids? Because I know for me, I'm, I'm a mother of five, and I want to make sure my kids are listening to the messages that you're putting out. And so I, w- on both of those things, um, have you thought about an online course for kids directly related to kids? Uh, well, um I, I do think it's necessary. I think mm-hmm. uh, this is the biggest gap right now is because people are always asking me what books should my kids read, like the right. younger kids, you know, right. w- and what video, whatever. This is a big gap that ought to be filled. I'm just not so sure I'm so good at Like, I can teach high schoolers. I'm not so sure. Mm-hmm. Now, my wife says I'm just being falsely modest here, but I'm not <laughs> really sure I know how to convey some of this stuff right. to the younger kids. I, I really don't know. Okay. But it, it does need to be done. The stuff that I've done, like the Politically Incorrect Guide or LibertyClassroom.com, this is mostly aimed at, I mean, if you had a bright high schooler, that person would have no problem going through these resources. Excellent. I know that you've talked about Social Security, Medicare opt-outs, and all, you know, opt-outs across the board, all of these things about free market, um, really the history and, and what our history is really about, where we're pointed to, where we're going. All of this has just been so educational for me. And I, I really want to thank you for putting the information out there because there's so few resources I feel like we have that really speak the truth. Well, I, I appreciate that. Thanks. And I mean, I, I just, my pr- thing is, I can't stop myself. Like back when I was a college kid, <laughs> right. I, I went to Harvard undergrad, and every night going to the dining hall, I would come across people who literally were selling a communist newspaper. And now, normal kids just walked right by them and just thought, well, these people are hopeless, and I'm not going to waste my time. I'm going to go eat dinner. Not me. I couldn't. The fact that the, <laughs> an error of this magnitude 
a, a moral error, a historical error, like everything. It was just horrible. It was going on right under my nose. It was too much for me to bear. And so I, could, I would have to stop before dinner, sometimes after dinner, come back out and just talk to them and talk to them and debate them, whatever. So I, every time I see a newspaper article that distorts something, a major paper that really distorts some historical thing, I, I turn my camera on, I make a YouTube, I go to my blog, I go to TomWoods.com, and I write about Because I just can't, from that moment I was in college, and I just thought, I can't believe I'm face-to-face with actual commies. I have not been able to just stop myself. So sometimes people, like I'll be on vacation, people will email me an article and say, you've got to refute this article. I can't even open the article till I get home because right. it'll eat away at me. Well, I don't have my camera with me. What am I going to do? <laughs> well, I know, I know Ron Paul has said about your book, if Congress and the administration really wanted to learn how to eliminate the deficit, limit government, and protect liberty, they would stop wasting taxpayers' money on debt commissions and instead read your book, Rollback. So I, I just have to commend you. Thank you so much, Tom, for joining us. I really appreciate Tom, this time. Tom, this, this has been time well spent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both. The Thank pleasure you. was mine. Okay, right. TomWoods.com and Liberty Classroom. I encourage everybody to check it out.